tempest within various historical contexts. That is, it not only analyzes the book as it emerges in the womb of capitalism, when processes of dispossession, not only of the English peasantry, but also of indigenous populations are taking place, but also within the context of emerging notions of class, as well as race, gender, discrimination, and disability are all playing out. Um, and the play, uh, as well as its various stagings, are brilliantly analyzed by her uh, in this remarkable piece of cultural analysis. So I would highly recommend that book. Um, and if you, you know, can't afford to buy it because it's expensive, please do order it for your library. It's called Shakespeare's Tempest and Capitalism. Now, in addition to being a scholar of post-colonial literature and theory, Helen is also a leading international scholar on the work of Rosa Luxemburg, which is what she's here to talk about today. She's the editor with Paul LeBlanc of a book called Socialism or Barbarism, a Lo Rosa Luxemburg anthology, as well as an editor of a book called The Essential Rosa Luxemburg. Helen has played a pivotal role along with a handful of other scholars and activists, some of whom are on this call today, I see, um, in drawing attention to the work of Rosa Luxemburg, the Polish revolutionary thinker, uh, an activist, and they have worked uh, quite hard to give her the place that she deserves within the socialist tradition. Finally, I'll end on a personal note by way of introduction. I've known Helen since she was a graduate student at Brown University back in the 1990s. We are dating ourselves, Helen here. <laughs> I am proud to call her my friend, comrade, and colleague. And in the 25 years that I have known her, I will say without hesitation that I've come across few people who are as systematic and thorough in their thinking as Helen. And not only is she a brilliant thinker and writer, but she's also an excellent speaker. And so I really look forward to this presentation and please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Helen Scott. Well, thank you so much for that heartwarming and generous introduction. It's not a very good way to start a lecture being choked up, but um, that did take, choke me up. <clears throat> thank you, Deepa. Um, and thank you to Patrick and to the Havens Wright Center for inviting me to talk. It's really an honor to participate in such a storied lecture series. Um, first, as a guest on this campus, I want to begin by reading this land acknowledgement that we would see if we were there in person. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly, but unsuccessfully, sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. The history of this history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. And second, I want to send solidarity greetings to the women of Poland who are currently waging an inspiring struggle for abortion rights, including yesterday leading a general strike that brought, brought tens of thousands out onto the streets. The spirit of Rosa Luxemburg lives on. So the subject of this lecture is what Rosa Luxemburg said and wrote about literature, but I want to begin by noting that Rosa Luxemburg has herself been the subject of numerous works of literary fiction in the century since her death, including the titular protagonist in Carl and Rosa, book four of Alfred Durblin's multi-volume, November 1918, A German Revolution, and in Rosa, the first in Jonathan Rabb's Berlin trilogy. She also gets passing references in a broad and diverse range of global literature. 
1931 Japanese proletarian novel Yasuko by Tajiki Kobayashi, for example, contains this exchange between two factory workers. Yasuko, her cheeks flushed, spoke passionately of the things she had been thinking about. In the end, she said, I can't remember her name, but there's a woman who devoted her life to workers and peasants and who's famous throughout the world. Here's what she says. Isoko closed her eyes for a moment to recall the phrase, her lowered long lashes were beautiful. She says, we must not live like trampled frogs. Ah, I remember now, exclaimed Yasuko. She's the great woman revolutionary, Rosa Luxemburg. And then shortly after, she reflects further. Looking at it from a different perspective, this work was extremely difficult and required a great many sacrifices, as the union man had said countless times and was written in the books she had borrowed. Rosa Luxemburg, the woman who had spoken about trampled frogs, had been thrown into prison dozens of times for her work and was finally beaten to death with rifle butts. It was a noble sacrifice for the sake of the exploited and hungry working people of the whole world. Her life was unforgettable, especially for the women of the working class. The letters that Rosa Luxemburg had sent from prison to her comrades on the outside were collected and published as a book in Japan too. The union man had brought her a copy and urged her to read it. Each evening after her work, Yasuko climbed up to her attic room to read and she had finished it within three days. It astounded her most of all that Rosa was a woman, just as she was. Now, in keeping with her own keen awareness of the historical insights provided by narrative fiction, we can learn a great deal about Rosa Luxemburg from these literary representations. Yasuko's account, albeit romanticized, touches on the key keynotes of Luxemburg's global legacy. Born and raised in Russian-occupied Poland, Luxembourg went to Germany at the turn of the 20th century in order to build the German Party of Social Democracy, the SPD. This was the largest organization in the Second International, which was the mass socialist network that represents a high point in working class struggle. A formidable intellectual, she made lasting contributions to Marxism. She launched a revolutionary critique of reformism in Reform and Revolution. She expanded upon Marx's analysis of capitalism in the accumulation of capital. She developed a critique of imperialism and militarism as inherent aspects of capitalism. And in the mass strike, she affirmed the revolutionary power of working class self-activity and traced the inextricable connections between the economic and political at times of heightened struggle. In 1914, when most of the leaders of social democracy abandoned internationalism and supported their respective national war efforts, Luxembourg organized the anti-war opposition, which grew from a minority current to a mass movement of workers and soldiers over the next four years. In all of this, she apprehended not only the economic and political, but also social, cultural, and human dimensions of capitalist exploitation, colonialism, and war. For this work, she was hounded by the state and suffered a series of prison sentences, but she also won lasting respect from the socialist movement and workers globally. From the beginning of her career in the SPD, even when she was still young and new, Luxembourg was willing to stand up against the established leaders and particularly the parliamentary representatives. Unlike many in the reformist wing of the party, Luxembourg was constantly in action and stayed close to the mass movement in the workplace and on the streets throughout her life. Popularly known as Red Rosa, she was a talented public speaker and had a sharp sense of the potency of image, figure and sound. One of my favorite passages, which is from a letter of 1898, captures her visceral sense of the political implications of language. She writes, I'm not satisfied with the way in which people in the party usually write articles. 
They are so conventional, so wooden, so cut and dry. Our scribblings are usually not lyrics, but whirrings, without color or resonance, like the tone of an engine wheel. I believe that the cause lies in the fact that when people write, they forget, for the most part, to dig deeply into themselves and to feel the whole important truth of what they're writing. I believe that every time, every day, in every article, you must live through the thing again. You must feel your way through it. And then fresh words coming from the heart and going to the heart would occur to express the old familiar thing. When I write, I firmly intend never to forget to be enthusiastic about what I write and to commune with myself. And her writing and speeches are indeed distinctive for their emotional intensity and figurative innovation. Luxembourg combined class analysis with a sharp awareness of all vectors of inequality and discrimination. And this was bolstered by her personal circumstances. She was Jewish in a climate of vicious anti-Semitism, Polish at a time when Poles suffered national repression. She was an individual with a physical impairment in a world stacked against people with disabilities and female in an overwhelmingly male dominated public sphere. As Yusuko reflects in the novel, Luxembourg's life was unforgettable, especially for the women of the working class. And she became and remains a point of reference for the left across the world. Now, thanks to my comrades, um, Rita Vakas and Peter Yudis, I can say that the probable source of Yusuko's quote about trampled frogs is a 1917 letter Luxembourg wrote from Breslau prison to her friend Louise Kautsky that was doubtless translated into Japanese in the 1920s. In that letter, she wrote, dearest, don't be despondent. Don't live like a little frog that's been stepped on. Not long after this, she wrote to another of her confidants, Sonia Liebknecht, you know that in spite of it all, I really hope to die at my post in a street fight or in prison. Now on her release from prison at the end of World War I, Luxembourg threw herself into mobilizing for the German revolution, but her life was cut short by the forces of counter-revolution. In January, 1919, she was detained, beaten with rifle butts and shot her body dumped unceremoniously in the Landwehr Canal in Berlin. Her murderers were soldiers of the Noski Guard, precursors of the Nazis, and they were doing the bidding of right-wing leaders of the social democratic government who were intent on reigning in the revolution and restoring the capitalist order. Now, given this life and death struggle, and Luxembourg's extraordinary contributions to revolutionary organization, economic and political theory, and the struggle for freedom and justice, the topic of literary criticism may seem incongruous or even frivolous. But creative literature and the arts more broadly occupied a significant location in her life's work and can be understood as central to her dialectical materialism and to her vision of human liberation. Despite the demands of playing a leading role in several socialist organizations for much of her life in three countries at the same time, maintaining a prolific publication record of articles in a range of journals and newspapers, as well as books and pamphlets, an endless round of public speaking everywhere from party conferences to the mines of Upper Silesia, not to mention a lengthy tenure as a loved and respected teacher at the party school, with all of this, Luxembourg nonetheless had a lot to say about the arts. Her writings on literature include formal literary analysis, lengthy discussions of a wide range of contemporary texts and performances in the letters, and innumerable references to classical and contemporary works in her articles, her essays, and her speeches. And these reveal her familiarity and affinity with a broad and diverse body of texts from the classical to the contemporary and in several languages. Now Luxembourg did not develop an explicit literary theory, but taken together, the, the epistolary and formal cultural commentary provides valuable insights for literary analysis. 
they draw a portrait of literature's capacity to express through powerful emotional affect, underlying social contradictions. And they remain deeply aware of and sensitive to the specificity of the aesthetic realm and the particular qualities of each individual work. In his 2009 assessment of Luxembourg's literary criticism, Subaranjam Dasgupta foregrounds this insistence that works of art must be judged on their own terms and calls it one of the basic tenets of enlightened Marxian aesthetics because artistic engagement or literary production always enjoy a high degree of autonomy. But despite, despite their rich potential, Luxembourg's discussions of literature have not previously received much attention in the English scholarship. The uh, Verso Complete Works promises to change that. This ambitious project is translating the German and Polish archives into English and making them available in a projected 17 volumes steered by the capable hands of Peter Hudis and a, a wonderful editorial board. One of those future volumes will be focused on culture, but those that have already been published and are in the works indicate the centrality of literary allusions and references throughout her work. In this, Luxembourg sometimes refers to fiction to illuminate histor historical conditions and at others to crystallize political insights. Even in the economic writings, Luxembourg quotes Boccaccio, Dante, Moliere, Schiller, Defoe, and her favorite Goethe. For example, she quotes a poem by Goethe in a discussion of the reproduction of capital, quote, the reproductive schema does not purport to present the moment of inception. Instead, it grasps this process in full flow as a link in, quote, existence's never ending chain. And in the middle of a complex explanation of surplus value, she reaches for a line from Goethe's Faust. There is still, quote, a leftover to be carried painfully. In using literature such ways, Luxembourg is within a long-standing Marxist tradition. Indeed, she sometimes evokes an earlier literary allusion from Marx in order to suggest a connection between different moments of revolutionary struggle. It is also obvious that literature was a significant part of the radical working class subculture of her own day. For example, Luxembourg describes the first issue of the journal New Life during the 1905 Russian Revolution. The issue included a satirical sketch by the writer Shirikov called The Eagle and the Hen, which supplied a parable for the shifting relationship between the working class and liberals. She later refers to the arrest of Shirakov during the suppression of the revolution, confirming that many of these writers were also themselves revolutionary activists. Luxembourg thus routinely draws on the political potential of literature. And as, as we will sh shall see, she also explores the unique possibilities of the aesthetic realm in its own right. The letters, which were collected in an English edition by Verso in 2011, contain not only references and allusions, but also more sustained discussions that reveal important aspects of Luxembourg's broader approach to literature. Take, for example, her comments about Simplicius Simplicimus in a November 1917 letter written from prison. This is a, a 17th century um, picaresque novel um, by Hans Jakob Christoph von Grimmelshausen, the second part of which um, provided the inspiration for Bertolt Brecht's Mother Courage. In this discussion, it's, it's a given that creative fiction can provide unique insight into socio-historical forces. Luxembourg writes of the novel, it is a vast and powerful portrait of the 30 years war era a picture of the barbarization of society in Germany at that time. She also notes literature for its deep emotional impact. Uh, Luxembourg advises her friend, quote, not to read it just now because it would de perhaps depress you very much, 
But while literature may evoke despair, it can also provide an escape from the world, a form of self-medication, especially at times of acute personal pain. She continues, I just read it all at one sitting, only in order to numb myself and be distracted because I have been struck a heavy blow. Hans Diefenbach has fallen. I know that life will go on, that one must continue and remain firm and courageous and even cheerful. I know all that and will soon be done with grieving it all by myself. This moving passage was composed at a moment of intense personal and political loss soon after she learned of the battlefield death of her beloved friend and comrade Hans Diefenbach in the context of the catastrophic slaughter of World War I. It's especially distressing in light of Luxembourg's rich correspondence with Diefenbach, which includes frequent exchanges of thought and feelings about literature. It's also part of her habitual recourse to literary fiction at times of adversity. In a July 1917 letter to Sonia Liebknecht, Luxembourg describes her reaction to a particular verse from Goethe that was running through her head. She writes, it was only the music of the words and the strange magic of the poem which lulled me into tranquility. I don't, myself, I don't know myself why it is that a beautiful poem, especially by Goethe, so deeply affects me at every moment of strong excitement or emotion. The effect is almost physical. It's as if with parched lips, I was sipping a delicious drink that cools my spirit and heals me, body and soul. This really typifies Luxembourg's sharp awareness of the capacity of literature to engage the senses and to impact us emotionally in ways that bypass intellectual processes. These lines, which are themselves characteristically figurative, indicate that literature's emotional force derives not only from the explicit content or subject matter, but also, and in some cases solely, from its linguistic and formal qualities. This is Luxembourg responding in 1909 to a depressed friend who had turned to the works of Pushkin for comfort during a crisis. She writes, when I was in a situation similar to yours, I submerged myself in Krzyzynski, a Polish poet you probably do not know. His verses in their content are the most trivial rubbish made up of Catholic mysticism, but in their sound, they are the purest music and I was enraptured by them. I read them mostly for their tone and color. This attention to the linguistic, imagistic and audible is a consistent thread running throughout the commentary, along with strongly held and not infrequently scathing critical judgment. Luxembourg frequently observes that literature is unsuccessful when its content overwhelms its form or when its explicit social purpose interferes with its artistic integrity. In a 1917 letter from prison to Diefenbach, she writes of her, quote, great, if cool, respect for German dramatist Friedrich Hebel, but ranks him below other favored playwrights. She goes on to say, he has a lot of intelligence and beauty of form, but there is too little life and blood in his characters. They are to a great extent merely signboards, though cleverly thought out and subtly refined, merely vehicles illustrating particular problems. In contrast, she expresses a great love for the Austrian dramatist Franz Grillparzer, recommending one of his pieces, pieces with this high praise. The purest Shakespeare in conciseness, aptness and popular humor, along with a tender poetic touch that Shakespeare doesn't have. At the same time, Luxembourg had no patience for formal experimentation that is void of meaningful content. In a letter to Sophie Liebknecht from November, November 1917, she denies the, the being predisposed against the modern poets, which uh, Sophie had, had accused her of, and mentions several modern poets that she enjoys, but then adds, it is true that in all of them, I take somewhat amiss the combination of perfect form with the absence of a grand and noble philosophy, 
this cleavage between form and substance produces in me an impression of vacancy so that the beauty of form becomes a positive irritant. As you can see, she could be a ruthless and cutting critic. The commentary on Grill Parser leads me to the last general lesson I want to draw from the letters. Long before the formalist objection to the intentional fallacy or the much vaunted postmodern death of the author, Luxembourg maintained that the text exists as a separate entity from the person who wrote it. The following lines from the letter praising Grill Parser illustrates this, while also showcasing her trademark irreverent and searing humor, in this case leveled not only at the author, but also Ferdinand Babel, a much lauded leading figure in the SPD and the Second International. She writes, isn't it laughable that in person, Grill Parser was a dry as dust government official and quite a boring fellow, parenthesis, see his autobiography, which is in almost as poor taste as Babel's. So this separation of artist from artwork is habitual, although in contrast to the formalist and the postmodernist, the author as a material being is often central to Luxembourg's assessment of a work's historical and political roots and its consequences. Despite, or maybe because of, the obvious value she placed on creative literature, Luxembourg could be quite caustic about literary criticism and critics. She responds to Diefenbach in a 1917 letter, quote, your idea that I should write a book about Tolstoy doesn't appeal to me one bit. For whom? What for, Henshin? Everyone can read Tolstoy's books, and if the books themselves don't give off a powerful breath of life, I wouldn't succeed in doing so through literary commentary. <clears throat> this letter also betrays playfully Luxembourg's tendency to a romantic approach to art. She goes on to say, can anyone explain to someone else what Mozart's music is? Can one explain what is the magic of life? <clears throat> but it also illustrates her contempt for the burgeoning literary critical industry. She writes, I also regard, for example, the monstrous amount of Goethe literature, that is, literature about Goethe, as pure trash. And it is my opinion that far too many such books have been written. What with all the literary noise, people forget to look at the world and all its beauty. Nonetheless, Luxembourg did herself produce some formal literary analysis over the span of her life. Um, the examples that are currently available in English include an assessment of the Polish national poet Adam Miskiewicz, uh, a review of Franz Mehring's biography of Schiller, the essay Tolstoy as Social Thinker, and um, lastly, Life of Korolenko, which was an extensive assessment of the Ukrainian-born Russian author and human rights activist Vladimir Korolenko. This latter work was written in Breslau prison in 1918 and published posthumously in 1990 as the introduction to Luxembourg's own German translation of the author's history of my contemporary. These pieces, one of which was among the last things she wrote, demonstrate that despite her distrust of the career critic, she did take the analysis of literature seriously. They also include some magnificent examples of writing that showcase Luxembourg at her rhetorical and political best. The 1898 assessment of Miskiewicz is exemplary. Um, Rory Castle's biographical research into Luxembourg's early life finds that her mother loved this poet and that Rosa grew up reciting the odes by heart. In this essay, she, the, this emotional connection is palpable, even while Luxembourg historicizes and contextualizes the poetry. She sets the stage by explaining the rapidly transforming conditions of Poland in the decades following its partition among Russia, Prussia, and Austria at the end of the 18th century. 
In the Russian occupied areas, she explained, the old nobility retained their ruling position. Quote, the ancestral seats of the nobility are still the centers of intellectual and literary life. The magnate is still the patron of the arts and art, meaning literature, is still either a leisure hours pastime for the well-born dilettante, whether sword bearing or soutane clad, or else a form of courtier's toadyism. She argues that this class was only capable of a derivative literature that looked to France where, quote, a powdery stilted pseudo-classicism reigned and all that got transplanted to Poland was washed out copy of that pseudo-classicism, its hallmarks being a smooth, still, hollow form and a total lack of individuality, inner feeling or deep thought. But revolu revolutionary change was underway to be expressed in 1831 in a popular revolt against Tsarist Russia. The ensuing challenges to the old order gave rise to a new class stratum, quote, a new intelligentsia that produced literature not for leisure or the court, but as a profession. These writers looked not to classicism, but to romanticism. And this is Luxembourg's account of the ensuing clash. Classicism versus Romanticism. Such was the antithesis which, with its roots in art and literature, reached its climax in economics and politics and was soon to reverberate in the clashing swords and rattling gunfire of rebellion. But if if victory on the battlefields of Grochow and Bra Praga went to the representatives of the established order, the Russian government, they yet had to draw the short straw on the battlefield of the spirit. While the classicist could offer only shelf upon shelf of a gray mass of mediocrities and soulless manipulators of form, romanticism, overnight as it were, conjured up whole constellations of glittering young talent from the womb of society. And as the most brilliant star of this dawn twilight, the mighty genius of Adam Miskiewicz arose in the firmament of Polish literature. <clears throat> now this is both formidable figurative writing in itself. Think about that paradox of paradoxical dawn twilight and it delivers a trenchant analysis of the reciprocal push and pull between historical forces and the cultural developments that are shaped by and in turn shape them. One of the striking aspects of this passage is her observation that the opposition appears first in arts and literature and then is realized in the economic, political and social realms. Another is the perception that social developments are readable in the very structural formal qualities of literature. And the last is the recognition that even when the movements that gave rise to them go down to defeat on the stage of history, as did the 1831 revolt, which was crushed, traces of those aspirations continue to animate cultural works. And this, Literary's, literature's revolutionary resonance is a topic Luxembourg frequently returns to. In her life of Korolenko, she argues that the great movement of 19th century Russian literature, quote, was born out of opposition to the Russian regime and out of the spirit of struggle. Her review of Franz Mehring's biography of Schiller notes that, the spread of Schiller's poetry across the proletarian layers of Germany has, without doubt, contributed to its intellectual elevation as well as its revolutionizing. And to that extent, it has, in a way, played its part in the work of the emancipation of the working class. Literature then may both be generated by and contribute to revolutionary social change. But Luxembourg rejects any attempt to claim authors or their work as socialist and or revolutionary per se. 
She writes scathingly of Polish socialists who, quote, try at all costs to derive evidence from Miskiewicz's writings for his socialist views, noting acerbically that this is not an attractive enterprise. Elsewhere, she writes, nothing, of course, could be more erroneous than to picture Russian literature as tendentious art in a crude sense, nor to think of all Russian poets as revolutionists or even progressives. Patterns such as revolutionary or progressive in themselves mean very little in art. For Luxembourg, the relationship between revolutionary social forces and artistic developments is far more indirect, mediated and contradictory. And it plays out regardless and often in spite of the views of the author, as we've already seen with reference to the unfortunate dry as dust grill parser. Dostoevsky, says, says Luxembourg, was an outspoken reactionary and Tolstoy's mystical doctrines reflect reactionary tendencies. And yet the writings of both have nevertheless an inspiring, arousing and liberating effect upon us. The reason for this is to be found in the literature itself. Quote, with the true artist, the social formula that he recommends is a matter of secondary importance. The source of his art, its animating spirit is decisive. So as this passage indicates, Luxembourg demonstrates the principle that each work of art must be evaluated on its own terms, independently of the author and not treated schematically as a political treatise. This is not to say that the author is unimportant. Her account of, of Russian literature points out that many of the greats were not only novelists, but also journalists and activists. And some quote, used literary criticism as an excellent weapon to fight backwardness and to propagate systematically a progressive ideology. She notes that Korolenko's committed opposition to the authorities and in particular to anti-Semitic and xenophobic scapegoating eventually led him to abandon poetry for journalism. But there is a powerful recognition that something about the artistic process itself is distinctive and decisive and operates on a level that's independent from the political realm. Luxembourg positions the Russian novel as a genre that offers unique insight into underlying social structures. She writes of the great and well-rounded view of the world, sensitive social consciousness, the restless search, the brooding over the problems of society, which enables it to observe artistically the enormity and inner complexity of the social structure and to lay it down in great works of art. Here and elsewhere, the suggestion is that the literary fragment can provide insight into the social totality of human relations, albeit in highly mediated and ever shifting ways. Some comprehension of these processes is offered in her account of the marginalized and the oppressed in the great works of 19th century Russian literature. Their focus is the impact of social inequality on the human spirit and quote, the tragedy of the triviality of the average man. Those with the least social power, the criminal, the prostitute, the disabled, the beggar, the peddler, the child, the minority. In this world of fiction, they take center stage. She writes, Turgenev, Aspensky, Korolenko and Gorky took up these stranded folk, the criminal as well as the prostitute, with a broad minded realism as equals in human society and achieve just because of this genial approach works of a high artistic effect. And then Luxembourg traces these qualities back to the reigning conditions of class struggle. She writes, the opposition to the Russian regime the spirit of struggle, this explains the richness and depth of its spiritual quality, the fullness and originality of its artistic form, above all, its creative and driving social force. Russian literature became, under Tsarism, a power in public life as in no other country and in no other time. And yet this appreciation of the liberating potential of literature 
coexists with the clearest understanding that literature and all culture is a product of class society and could not exist with the outs with the, without the exploitation of the producing class who were nonetheless largely excluded from its enjoyment. Luxembourg's 1908 discussion of Tolstoy's writing on art is very illuminating on this question. Tolstoy's commentary is, is, by the way, historically bounded. His subject is high art, because this is really before the, the, the advent of, of the mass culture of modernity, but the implications are still relevant. For Tolstoy, Luxembourg explains, art, contrary to all aesthetic and philosophical scholastic opinions, is not a luxury product for releasing feelings of beauty, joy, or the like in beautiful souls, but an important form of social communication, like language between people. Proceeding from what Luxembourg, Luxembourg calls this genuinely materialist and historical criterion, she summarizes Tolstoy's argument. The whole of existing art is, with a very few small exceptions, incomprehensible to the great mass of society, that is to say, working people. Instead of concluding from this with the customary view that the great masses are intellectually coarse and need to be raised to understand contemporary art, Tolstoy reaches the opposite conclusion. He declares existing art to be false art. Ever since society has been split into a great exploited mass and a small ruling minority, art only serves to express the feeling of the rich and leisurely minority. Well, Luxembourg has great admiration for, for Tolstoy's analysis. She notes, there is a real revolutionary radicalism when he smashes the hopes that reduction in working hours and improving education among the masses will create understanding of art. Instead, seeing that art is necessarily based on the oppression of the masses, and it can only be sustained by sustaining this oppression. She, she really contrasts Tolstoy's materialist approach here with the idealism of the reformists in German social democracy. She says, this right, this right, the writer of this, sorry, is every inch more of a socialist and a historical materialist too than those party members mixing with the latest artistic crankiness who want with thoughtless zeal to quote, educate social democratic workers to an understanding of the decadent daubings of a slave oiked or a hurdler. <laughs> so she likes all of that about Tolstoy, Tolstoy but then she also um, detects many errors. She says Tolstoy's got a very static understanding of class. He fails to understand the fluidity of class society and he also lacks any sense of the working class as agent of change. So Tolstoy for Luxembourg belongs with the great utopians of socialism. But she comes back to this question of the class ownership of culture in a 1903 essay, Stagnation and Progress of Marxism. In this, she writes, in every class society, intellectual culture is created by the ruling class. And the aim of this culture is in part to secure the direct satisfaction of the needs of the social process, and in part to satisfy the mental needs of the members of the governing class. While in earlier periods, emergent ruling classes could develop new artistic and scientific cultures to assist their aspirations, Luxembourg argues that the, under capitalism, the working class, a non-possessing class, cannot follow this. She says, it cannot, the working class cannot, in the course of its struggle upwards, spontaneously create a mental culture of its own while it remains in the framework of bourgeois society within that society, and so long as its economic foundations persist, there can be no other culture than bourgeois culture. She continues, notwithstanding the fact that the workers create with their own hands the whole social substratum of this culture, they are only admitted to its enjoyment insofar as such admission is requisite to the satisfactory performance of their functions in the economic and social process of capitalist society. So the oppressed cannot create their own culture 
under the condi conditions imposed by capitalism and are largely excluded from the enjoyment of the existing arts. But culture is nonetheless deeply important to the project of emancipation. She writes, the utmost the working class can do today is to safeguard bourgeois culture from the vandalism of the bourgeois reaction and create the social conditions requisite for free cultural development. This notion of the oppressed as protectors and inheritors of culture runs throughout Luxembourg's work. And so too does this recognition that literature can carry traces of the aspirations and struggles of the exploited. In her scornful rejection of those attempts to claim Miskevich as socialists, Luxembourg affirms the value of his poetry for the working class movement. She writes, the enlightened proletariat is surely intellectually mature enough to love and honor this great poet for his poetic genius without needing an inducement for the unclear mystical utopian social imaginings of his period in decline. The class whose goal is the renewal of the world can have no such narrow horizons. As discussed earlier, Luxembourg argues that Schiller's poetry has, quote, in a way played its part in the work of emancipation, but this is qualified. She writes, Schiller's role in the intellectual growth of the revolutionary proletariat is not so much rooted in what he himself imported into the working class struggle for emancipation through the content of his poems, but rather the reverse. It consists in what the revolutionary working class deposited in Schiller's poems based on its own worldview, its strivings and its feelings. And this process is multi-stranded and it takes place at sites of both production and reception. Previous moments of class struggle found their way into Schiller's poetry and contemporary movements create readers who are able to make use of it now. Luxembourg's position here is very close to that developed by Walter Benjamin in the 1930s. Benjamin famously avowed that there is no document of culture which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. But he also looked to culture for glimpses of a quote, revolutionary chance in the fight for the oppressed past. Like Benjamin, Luxembourg uncovers the barbarism behind the cultural treasure, revealing the history and continuity of exploitation and expropriation that make it possible. And also like Ben Mean, Luxembourg nonetheless finds therein traces of the traditions of the oppressed. And all of this is completely apposite and speaks to contemporary literary debates and social debates. The current renewed interest in Luxembourg has started to expand into post-colonial studies, which is my primary field. Um, it, it can be seen in publications such as Rosa Luxembourg, Capitalism, Imperialism and the Post-Colonial in 2018, and also the forthcoming collection, Creolizing Rosa Luxembourg, which is an exploration of her significance for current feminist, anti-racist and decolonial struggles. But the full significance of Luxembourg's cultural writings has yet to be registered. Her recognition of the paradoxical push and pull of creative literature speaks to contemporary debates in the context of both the resurgent far right and mass movements against systemic racism. In an appeal to Shakespeare scholars earlier this year, Kimberly Ann Coles Kim F. Court Hall and Ayanna Thompson describe current attempts by white supremacists to appropriate medieval and early modern literature. Coles and Hall and Thompson argue that this can only be contested if we acknowledge the blood and violence that made English literature possible. They write, the colonial project is stitched in and through the language and literatures of the pre and early modern periods, the politics and economics that ultimately produced settler colonialism, chattel slavery, the forced migration of peoples, and the development of the British Empire 
animate these early English texts, the barbarism behind the cultural work. And in her new work, in her new book, Azadi, Freedom, Fascism, Fiction, Arundhati Roy identifies the specific literary qualities that can offer alternatives to the fake histories associated with right-wing ideology. She says, the foundation of today's fascism rests on a deeper foundation of a more sophisticated set of fake histories that elide the stories of caste, of women, and a range of other genders, and of how those stories intersect below the surface of the grand narrative of class and capital. To challenge fascism means to challenge all of this. Fiction is uniquely positioned to do this because fiction has the capaciousness, the freedom and latitude to hold down a universe of infinite complexity. Now, like Luxembourg, Roy rejects any tendentious or instrumental approach. She says, she's not talking about fiction as expose or as the writer of social wrongs, fiction that is a disguised manifesto or written to address a particular issue or subject, but looks rather to the novel's ability, quote, to recreate the universe of the familiar. Luxembourg's analysis continues to provide insight into these contested and contradictory forces. As one would expect from such a formidable dialectician, she traces the multifaceted relationships between historical and cultural developments, unearthing the violent roots of literature, and insists that each work is more than simply the sum of its historical parts, but must be appreciated on its own terms, according to the particular elements of genre and form. Balancing materialist context with a sharp recognition of the aesthetic, the sensual and emotional affect, Luxembourg thus offers an alternative to the pitfalls of idealist literary criticism in which textual analysis takes place in a vacuum without reference to the structural inequalities that are the preconditions for cultural production and to ideology critique, which reduces literature to anthropology or unwitting political testimony. And while insisting that socialists do not need political cover for appreciating art, she points to the ineffable potential for literature to imagine possible alternatives, or in her words, to capture and nurture the spirit of struggle. Well, that was fantastic. Um, really stimulating and amazingly provocative. Um, and inspiration, I'm sure, for lots of questions and comments. And at this point, that's what we'd like to do is move to uh, that period. We have roughly um, 30 minutes left if we wanna end by 5.30 p.m. Central Time. And the way we're gonna proceed is the way we typically do, which is to say that um, for those of you who might not be altogether familiar with the way Zoom works, at the bottom of your screen, there is a menu, um, one item of which is called participants. If you click on that, you'll see that you have an option for raising your hand. Um, that will alert me that you want to ask a, com a question or make a comment. It doesn't have to be in the form of a question. You can offer your own um, insights and commentary on what Helen has talked about. Uh, we do ask you to keep it somewhat brief so that we can get to as many people as possible. Uh, the way I'm going to proceed is to take three such comments or questions at a time and then turn it over to Helen. If you're um, less inclined to use that, uh, to go on screen because we're gonna ask you to activate your cameras when you ask your question or make your comment, you can also do it via the chat function, which is to the immediate right of that participants function on the menu and I'll simply read out your comment or question to Helen. So uh, we've already got uh, one person who's raised her hand. 
namely Nancy Welch. Nancy, go ahead. Please activate your camera, if you will. Thank you very much for that um, just brilliant and inspiring talk, Helen. Uh, whenever I've had a student who um, has wanted to approach a literary work as a political treatise, um, I've turned them uh, towards uh, Julian Markle's The Marxian Imagination, and then sometimes also uh, Trotsky's um, Literature and Revolution. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how um, Luxembourg's work is, is in dialogue with those texts or what, um, what she does perhaps beyond those texts. All right, is there anyone else who would like to uh, jump in and ask a question or make a comment? Yes, so uh, Deepa Kumar, please go ahead. Ah, uh, great. Thank you, Helen. That was really fantastic. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I, my question is similar to Nancy's, which is I really appreciated, you know, all of the incredible um, contributions that Luxembourg has made to cultural and literary criticism from you know, the tension between looking at the work on its own, but also centering the author, viewing a work of art within its social totality, seeing it as a product of class society. Um, it is you know, a really rich historical materialist approach to cultural criticism. And you spoke about Tolstoy, and you also spoke about Benjamin. Um, but while you were talking, it reminded me of some of the things that uh, uh, Raymond Williams has argued, and then when you talked about how there are traces of uh, resistance in all literary works, reminded me of Said's notion of contrapuntal readings, right? So there are reflections of things that in what you were saying that to me, other people much after her um, have said. And so I wonder if you could place her, I suppose, um, within the tradition of Marxist literary and cultural criticism and say what engaging with her writing, albeit limited, on this um, sort of gives us a sense of her contributions, which are not, it seems to me, fully recognized or appreciated. Okay, I have a, a question or comment from Lionel Beasley. And for those of you who, um, for the next cluster, just think about it, you can go ahead and raise your hand via the participant function and then we'll take you with the next cluster of questions. Go ahead, Lionel. Uh, hello, yes. I had a um, question. I was particularly interested, uh, wonderful talk, by the way. Um, but I was particularly interested in Luxembourg's idea of um, the working class being unable to produce art outside of um, the uh, bush, outside of bourgeois culture. Because um, I was really interested in that in, in terms of the Marxist dialectic and the way that um, art is produced um, in order to support the interests of the working class. But how that works when we think of, say, um, reappropriation, the way that Amy Cesar, for instance, took um, the Tempest and created a Tempest so that uh, now we're allowing the working class of the oppressed to speak through the voice of that bourgeois literature. But also, um, from my own personal perspective, how what you think of, say, the work of um, hip hop, say, in reappropriating different kinds of sounds and sampling um, in order to create a new message, or even um, urban art, which actually took um, some of those disused industrial spaces and used them as, as canvases for a new type of art. Um, thank you. Okay, so those are your three questions and you can go ahead and we'll get the next cluster lined up. Thank you. It's my turn again already. <laughs> Seems like yes. I've been talking for a long time and I have to talk more. You know, I've, I've, I've been reading um, a lot of the transcribed lectures that Luxembourg gave at various party conferences and I'm just always stunned by how long they were that, you know, she's talking for, for hours and you know I just talking for that long I've already I'm already losing my voice so 
you know, yet again, her, the stamina of, of Rosa is just, it, it floors me. Um, but yes, to those questions, her relationship to the Marxist tradition, I think that the, the figures that both um, Nancy and Deepa mentioned, um, you know, including Trotsky going back in, in, in history, Ben Amin, Tolstoy, um, Julian Markel, more recently Raymond Williams, <clears throat> there is a thread of dialectical Marxist criticism that I would say doesn't belong to one particular school, um, but there are figures who are you know, scattered throughout the last century who represent high points. And I, I think this ties into Lionel's question too, that um, the high points of dialectical Marxist criticism, the type that does avoid the, the pitfalls that I described and that manages to hold together the contradictions in the way that Luxembourg does, is very much impacted by political struggle. You know, that the high points come, the, the great recognitions come at moments when there's a lot of opposition and a lot of struggling going on in society. Um, you know, these are the things that produce the, 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 um, the best of those critics, just as they also impact creative literature. So, you know, turning back to Lionel's question, um, Luxembourg's point is that there can't be such a thing as a working class culture under capitalism because capitalism controls and owns everything. That doesn't mean that working class artists can't produce brilliant and innovative works. And it doesn't mean either that um, movements can't produce dynamic and innovative works. And so, you know, you think about, yes, Aimé Césaire and what he does with appropriating the Tempest, that period, the 60s, the, well, really from the anti-colonial movement through the Black Liberation Movement in the 60s, was an incredibly creative, rich cultural moment um, you know, with the um, Pan-African artistic movements that just transformed art and culture permanently. So that sense that under capitalism, all culture is bourgeois is both true, like who owns the publishing houses, who owns the theatres, who owns all of the, in the televisions and, 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 and recording company, you know, we know that it's owned by the ruling class, but that doesn't mean that working class people and the oppressed can't create art within that system. Okay, um, please, if you have a question or comment, indicate to me via the, um, by raising your hand through the participants function. Uh, I do have a question um, from Gus via chat who asks, how did Rosa Luxemburg influence Antonio Gramsci's views? Uh, I also have a hand raised by P Peter Hudis. Peter, if you can go ahead and act, uh, um, ask your question. Can't see if you've acted, there is. Yeah. Thank you very much. A great talk, uh, Helen. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, kind of following up a little bit on Lionel's question, and I, I think you, you responded very, very well to it. Um, but at the same time that Luxembourg is writing a lot of the material that you were discussing, there was this enormous birth of a Yiddish culture, a Yiddish literature, Yiddish theater in the Russian empire and in Poland um, that took various manifestations. And much of it was a kind of working class cultural manifestation. I'm not aware though that she paid attention to that or that she re referenced that. Do you have any thoughts on why that was? Was it a kind of a modernist bent of her own thinking about literature that might have influenced that? Or was it more of her own political opposition to the Bund and staying away from what anything that would uh, reek of, in her view, cultural nationalism that may have, um, uh, so to speak, led her to overlook that? Um, because in a certain sense, I think there's a kind of a parallel 
you can make in a strange way, perhaps, between that creative burst of this decades of rich uh, Yiddish literary production in the Russian Empire, and then the kind of working class literature you get from a Richard Wright and a Chester Himes in Black America, you know, just a generation later, that also reverberates so many of the themes that were that were expressed at that time. Okay, we've got room for one more in this cluster of three. Does anybody else have a question or comment they'd like to offer? If not, um, continue to think about it and you can get into the next cluster. All right, Helen, why don't you tackle those two questions from Gus and Peter? Um, well, firstly, I was actually hoping that somebody else would address the question of Luxembourg and Gramsci because that is not something that I'm an expert in. And I know that there are people who are um, doing groundbreaking work on exploring that relationship. And maybe Peter knows more and, and you know, he should feel free to address that, but it's outside my area of specialty. Remember, I'm a literature scholar who is <laughs> poaching on uh, areas of political economy that um, are uh, not my, my central talent. Um, but I can I, you know, address uh, Peter's question. There are whole areas of culture. I mean, I'm hoping that the greater accessibility of um, more of her writings you know, through this great translation project, I'm hoping that that will bring to light more discussions about broader areas of culture, including folk, folk culture and including, you know, the Yiddish theatrical tradition, for example, I'm sure she would have had things to say about that. And I, I can't think that it's simply her um, political, you know, differences, because she elsewhere does speak passionately in defense of Polish folk culture and you know, Jewish cultural traditions. Um, so maybe something is out there that I haven't come across yet. But I do think I'm, I'm often struck by, again, within the materials that I have had access to and have read and looked at, that she's, she talks mostly about, um, you know, what we would now call high literature, uh, what later becomes defined as high literature. It's the canon. Um, and I would be so curious to hear more of what she would say about what we would call popular culture. I know that she read popular fiction of her time. You hear her talking about works that she then, you know, it's like she, she thinks that they're a bit trashy, <laughs> but she sees them as valuable. And that's what I mean about understanding culture in its own terms. Um, so you don't get a sense of snobbery or elitism ever, which makes me think that she would have very interesting things to say about broader areas. There's also the whole question about, um, you know, that it's very European. I mean, she's, she's looking at, uh, within Europe, she knows many languages and it's very diverse, but there's no sense of knowledge of cultural traditions outside of, of Europe. Um, yeah, I think I'll close it there to allow a few other voices to come in. So yes, if there are other people who would like to, again, to offer a question or comment, um, please indicate. If in the meantime, while you're thinking about doing that, maybe um, Peter would like to take up Helen's um, offer to respond to the question about the connection between Luxembourg and Gramsci, if he's so inclined. Uh, okay, well, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, I mentioned uh, two people who have written on this recently and have produced some interesting study. Richard R Wainwright has a lengthy essay on Luxembourg and Gramsci uh, that tries to look at the similarities and connections between the two. And Sevgi Dogan, uh, who's a Turkish uh, feminist, who's also uh, written an extensive piece on this. Um, just briefly, I would say that Gramsci does refer to Luxembourg um, and discusses Luxembourg in some detail in a section of the prison notebooks and somewhat critical of Luxembourg because he read Luxembourg's mass strike pamphlet um, as uh, economic deterministic. Uh, and I think he somewhat misread the mass strike pamphlet in, in making that charge against it. That is, she thought Luxembourg was too fatalistic that the 
social revolution was an inevitable product of the economic uh, contradictions of capitalism. Um, whereas, of course, he was trying to look for um, uh, and explanations that explain why the proletarian revolution was not coming to power, given uh, the rightness of the economic conditions or, or, uh, for, for socialism. Um, but nevertheless, the attitude, I think, towards consciousness and uh, class consciousness between the two of them, uh, it's just something that Richard Rain White, right, for instance, uh, spends a lot of time on in his piece, um, are very, very similar in many, many respects. Uh, and I, so I think there's a lot of, uh, there's more similarity between them than they would know from Gramsci's specific references to Luxembourg uh, in the prison notebooks. He earlier, of course, also during the Turin period, has a number of references, uh, positive references to Luxembourg uh, in a more general sense. Uh, but I think that um, uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in that area. One thing that is different between the two of them though is, and that might have guided Gramsci's kind of critical remarks uh, on the mass strike pamphlet, I'm not sure that he ever read the accumulation of capital, um, is uh, he saw his project as an explicitly, Gramsci that is, an explicitly philosophical project. Um, and Luxembourg did not so explicitly pose her project in those kinds of terms. And I think that might've been some of the tension that, uh, that existed between them on it. But it's a field of study that is wide open for a lot of people to take further. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, I do have a question in the chat from Alicia Anstead, who asks, well, she states, she's curious if American authors such as Clifford Odets and Tess Schlesinger and others of their cohort in the US were influenced by Luxembourg's work. Anybody else wanna offer a question or a comment? If not, I'll just hand it over to Helen to respond to Alicia's question. Why don't you go ahead with that question, Helen? Thanks, Alicia. Good to good to um, hear. Well, not to hear your voice, but to know you're there. Um, the, I mean, the this kind of maybe maybe gets to whether Tess Schlesinger in particular did. But that period in the 1930s, the extent to which Luxembourg was a part of that culture, um, <laughs> I hate to keep deferring to Peter, but um, I think that both Luxembourg has been, as I said before, a sort of touchstone. And yet in many ways, um, as, as Deepa suggested in her question earlier, not as acknowledged as other major revolutionary Marxist figures. And I would say also that she has been claimed, misclaimed and misrepresented, I think perhaps more than any other of the, certainly the sort of great Marxists of, this, of the Second International. And part of that is, is definitely gendered. Um, there is a whole tradition of very just, you know, sexist and reductive attempts to turn her into a reflection of whatever the person wants to see. Um, and that, you see that by the way, in literary representations too, um, that there are versions of, um, you know, a very romanticized, it's like the, the, the good Marxist antithesis of the hard Marxists who are male. Um, so there are, there are many traditions of misrepresentation. And I think that there are misinterpretations of her work, but, there's also, you know, that she's also been a consistent thread through all of those, high, and I, I would say it, at high points again of working class struggle, um, Luxembourg comes back, you know, you get new publications um, of her work at moments when the labor movement is really moving. 
but in terms of you know the specific question, I would I would be very curious to know if Tess Schlesinger had read Rosa Luxemburg. I don't know. Okay. So we still have uh, time for more questions or comments. So if anybody is brave enough to put forward a question or comment, please do so. Indicate either via raising your hand or the chat function. So I have a, a raised hand from Ari Kotler. Ari, go ahead. Hello. Hi, Helen. Um, first, I want to say thank you for an incredible talk. I learned a lot. I'm actually a student at, at UVM where Helen teaches. Um, so uh, this might be a little bit of a naive question, but um, what, you know, what, what do you think, um, how do you think Rosa would have approached the problem of interpreting, um, in, of, of, of interpreting ideology um, in texts in our sort of age of post ideology. Um, do you know what I mean? Say a little bit more about, about what you mean by an age of po post ideology. Um, yeah, so I mean, my mind is immediately going to um, you know, Fukuyama's The End of History and the, you know, all the horrible reproductions of that idea that have followed it. But um, I think, you know, there's this idea um, that I agree with that uh, there is, it's almost part of the ideological landscape now to think that there's no ideological landscape. And so there's almost implicit a critique of ideology critique. And how to, how to you know, how would someone like Rosa who had this sort of ambivalent position towards critiquing ideology in literary texts, um, you know, thread that, you know, negotiate that sort of fine line between um, the already sort of existing hostility towards saying, hey, look, this is a, you know, problematic ideology, you know, displayed in this text that reproduces the social structure in this way, et cetera. So maybe a, a naive question, maybe not totally clear, but no, no. I think it's it's a it's a good question. Um, I think she would have been utterly scathing <laughs> about that position because she was so grounded always in the material realm. Um, and as I said, she was such a talented dialectician, you know, able to. Um, recognize the social roots of different ideological form formations um, and and she because she was grounded in the movement you know she was never an, an, an academic you know I mean she she got her PhD and she was a talented teacher and she was a great intellectual but she didn't get um, buffeted by the fashionable you know, streams of academic thought. And so I think she would have, it's always strange to, to, to do that hypothetical, but there were, you know, ideas in her own age that um, were utterly dismissive of the project of um, achieving a greater understanding, you know, achieving greater understanding of the truth, <laughs> she was very, very dismissive of. Um, I think she would see them as the sort of, you know, the way that she talked about the fashionable currents in modern art of her time, the, those fashionable daubings. <laughs> I think that she would have uh, taken that approach. But I like to say her guiding post was always the movement on the ground. And that's what kept her grounding. She would be looking to the you know, the inspiring movement for racial justice right now and the, the women's strikes um, and um, the possibilities of an alternative beyond academia and beyond the ballot box. Um, I think we could, 
we could use more figures like her <laughs> for that reason right now. I hope that addresses your question a little bit. Okay, well, so uh, we have one last question. Uh, I'm afraid that's all we have time for from Joshua. Ah, thanks for the unmute. And also thank you so much for the, the talk. It was really helpful. Um, I was just wondering if you wouldn't, oh yeah, start my video. Okay, hello. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about um, Rosa's relationship to like philosophy and art, like philosophy of art. Cause I know we kind of gestured uh, towards in the Gramsci question um, to maybe differing uh, approaches in those two figures. But I'm also kind of curious, like if the, the kind of secondary literature reflecting on um, art objects was like uh, universally dismissed by Luxembourg, or if that was something she was interested in, or, uh, yeah, I'll stop there, but thank you. Actually, before you, before you stop, just give me a little bit more of, about, I'm just trying to think where to take that question. Tell me what the, the most, what's, what's the thing in there that you're most interested about? What's the core of your question? Well, the core of my question really is like related to this, these claims about uh, Rosa being a dialectician, right? And mm -hmm. so the, the figure in my head is Hegel, right? So uh, Hegel says that art at a certain point is no longer the supreme mode of knowing the absolute. And so once that happens, it seems that art uh, requires philosophy after a certain point, it requires religion, then it requires philosophy. And so um, I'm kind of curious if this like constant attention to the text themselves and this uh, maybe bracketing of the secondary reflections on them is maybe even just like a philosophical maneuver on its own. Okay. Yeah, I think part of the problem with, with this is that, as I said earlier, Luxembourg never developed a theory of art. And so it's hard, I think, to, and I don't want to start speculating about how she might have responded to certain, you know, philosophy of art positions because she didn't, she didn't do that. So what I'm trying to do is, is draw from the commentary that she has, you know, her, her very, detailed um, engagement with particular works and then the way that she uses references to literature that and sort of extrapolating out from that what her dialectical understanding of the relationship between you know culture and society art and history what they are um, and, and I think, I mean, the, the, the places where she does come closest to developing a theory are those, you know, formal works of criticism that I quoted from. And I think that that's where you would need to go to see more of the implications. But um, I think what, for me, what she represents in the way that she talks about specific works of art is something that is distinct um, and that it doesn't quite fit into any of the kind of schematic schools of Marxist criticism that we uh, that have have been that we have that we can look to. Um, but I also am kind of interested in and like to think about um, a different thread of materialist literary criticism that is not at school in itself and that you see uh, you know the kind of continuity of some of the figures that have been that were referred to earlier um, so it's it's both distinct but it's not a school and you know I maybe again I'm, I'm hoping that more uh, formal analysis will be unearthed in this big translation project um, and that maybe we will get more of an answer to that question.
but thanks, thanks, thanks for the question. Thanks everybody for the questions. Well, thank you very much. This was extremely stimulating and, and, and interesting. Um, I think that uh, everybody, I, I'm speaking for everyone when I say um, that this was ex very, very valuable and we're very grateful for you taking the time to share this with us, um, both the presentation and the discussion. Um, one more uh, reminder that uh, we have other speakers coming up and um, if we're gonna share on screen uh, the list of of speakers who are coming up as well at the bottom of your screen there at the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, the Havens Wright Center website uh, where you can find even more information. So hopefully you'll come back uh, and join us again next week and subsequent weeks. All you need to do is register uh, via the links on our website and you will get access to um, these Zoom events. Once again, thanks very much to Helen. Uh, 